Welcome back to Click Revision. Now that we've investigated each of the Burlings in turn, we're going to turn our attention to Inspector Ghoul. We're going to look at how he's described, his personal politics and his feelings towards each of the Burlings. We'll also examine his interview techniques and how he manipulates each of the characters to get what he wants from them. But first, how should we go about looking at the Inspector as a character? Is he a man? Is he a ghost? Or God? Or the devil? Or is he something else entirely? Well, we'll look at this in more detail in a later video. But for now, try to think about the Inspector as being all of those things. Try not to get too fixed on one solution, because there isn't one single solution. In fact, the more possible meanings you can take away from the play, the more likely you are to be able to show understanding in your exam. Ultimately, it doesn't matter who or what you believe the Inspector is, as long as you recognise that he is a symbolic figure, and a way for J.B. Priestley to put forward his views of the world and try to promote community spirit and socialism. So, let's start by having a look at how J.B. Priestley describes him in the stage directions. It says that the Inspector creates at once an impression of massiveness, solidity and purposefulness, so he has to be a physically imposing presence on the stage. He needs to be someone who looks like he can command a room in which he isn't welcome, because that's exactly what the Inspector does throughout the play. He's in his 50s, making him about the same age as Mr. Burling, and he's wearing a plain darkish suit. He's dressed plainly so that people will expect him to be ordinary, when in truth he is anything but, and his suit is dark because he represents the dark side of the upstanding, respected Burling family. He's like a dark cloud, floating from Burling to Burling, destroying their secure, privileged world. He speaks carefully, weightily, so you know he's serious and has something important to say. And this also shows he's calm and intelligent. And finally, he has a disconcerting habit of looking hard at the person he addresses before actually speaking, so he's an intimidating person to have a conversation with. The first thing to note about the inspector is that he is incredibly controlled in his behaviour. Even when he raises his voice, he is measured. And as he tells Mrs. Burling, he never takes offence. He's also clearly very determined and will not easily be put off his investigation. Upon entering the Burling house, the inspector's polite, and he limits himself to very short comments until he's been invited in and offered a seat. He gives nothing away until Mr. Burling begins to show impatience. And then he gives them all the horrible details of Eva Smith's death all at once. Clearly, Ghoul's intention here is to disarm the three men in the room by shocking them. And though Burling isn't moved by the girl's death very much, it stops him being impatient for long enough for the inspector to start his questions. Now, as we've established, Inspector Ghoul chooses the order in which he will interview the characters deliberately. And if he's to achieve this, then he has to always be in control. He claims that he's separating each character out because it's the way I like to work. One person and one line of inquiry at a time, otherwise there's a muddle. And Burling seems to respect this, calling it sensible. However, the Inspector has deeper motives than this. By keeping the characters separate, he is controlling the flow of information, and ensuring he can get everybody's story from them. He limits who sees the photograph of Eva Smith, possibly because he shows each person a different photo, and he dictates who should stay and leave at any given time, and sometimes leaves the room himself in order to give the Burlings a false sense of security. He also asks direct questions, which means he generally gets the answer he's looking for, and can lead each conversation in the direction he chooses. He basically has a divide-and-conquer methodology, and never puts himself in a position where the other characters can gang up upon him. So, Inspector Ghoul interviews Mr. Burling first, which makes sense because he's the head of the household, and without getting through him, the Inspector probably won't get to speak to anyone. The Inspector clearly doesn't like Mr. Burling very much, and is unthreatened by Burling's attempts to intimidate him with his status, so we can assume he isn't a very big fan of the upper classes in general. He clearly disagrees with Burling's philosophy of taking care of yourself at the expense of everyone else, and isn't afraid for Burling to know it. The Inspector's comment here is really important, because it sums up one of the key messages of the play. By saying it's better to ask for the earth than to take it, 
Ghoul is batting Burling's ideas of selfism and taking care of yourself right back at him, and arguing that Burling should be helping those less fortunate than him, rather than punishing them for it. The same can be said about this exchange. Here, Burling is angrily complaining to the inspector about his nice family celebration being turned into a nasty mess, and the inspector instantly flips the conversation back to being about Eva Smith and the nasty mess her suicide made of her. The fact the inspector repeats Burling's own words back at him creates a strong contrast and forces the audience to question Burling's priorities. In fact, throughout the evening, the inspector continually brings the conversation back to the dead girl and how impoverished her life was. He shows constant empathy for the conditions in which Eva Smith lived and will not let the Burlings forget that people have a moral responsibility to one another. The inspector definitely isn't afraid of offending Mr. Burling, who calls the inspector's questions uncalled for and officious, and Burling seems to get more angry with the inspector as the evening goes on, and the inspector implicates his family more and more. So, after he's finished with Burling, Inspector Ghoul interviews Sheila, and this is a good example of how the inspector controls the flow of information for his own gain. At first, the inspector shocks Sheila with the details of the suicide. But then he sits back a bit and answers some of the questions that she has for him. He's particularly harsh here, forcing Sheila to really picture the agony of Eva Smith's death and the horrible state it left her body in. Then he shows Sheila the picture of Eva Smith, which causes her to break down and run out of the room. Why does he do this? Well, he already knows that Sheila will be horrified at the thought of contributing to the girl's death, so when she returns, she already feels guilty enough to tell him everything. This is another one of the inspector's tricks. He doesn't so much as interrogate the others. He simply finds a way to get people to speak, and then just listens to them. As Sheila says later, he's giving us the rope so that we'll hang ourselves. He simply has to wind the characters up enough for them to start talking, and then just leaves them to it. Sheila lays herself bare for him, because she feels guilty about the death of Eva Smith because the inspector has pushed the right buttons to get the reaction he wants. As she tells Gerald later, somehow he makes you talk. Nonetheless, despite his manipulations, Inspector Ghoul clearly has more respect for Sheila than he does for Mr. Burling, because he shows her some degree of compassion. Firstly, he says Sheila's not entirely to blame, and then later, when Gerald tries to persuade the inspector to send Sheila out of the room, he supports her, explaining why she feels compelled to stay. She feels responsible, and if she leaves now and doesn't hear any more, then she'll feel she's entirely to blame. She'll be alone with her responsibility the rest of tonight, all tomorrow, all the next night. This kindness draws Sheila to him. She's fascinated by him at this point, and is definitely part of the reason she's so quick to start helping him break down the barriers put up by Gerald and Mrs. Burling. As the inspector says when Mrs. Burling tells him he's made an impression on Sheila, we often do on the young ones, they're more impressionable. Gerald is interviewed next, but the inspector needs to set up the situation to his liking first, so he mentions the name Daisy Renton. We know the inspector already knows Gerald is implicated in Eva Smith's death because he asks him to stay when he first arrives, so we can assume that he also knows how Gerald and Daisy Renton knew each other from reading the dead girl's diary. By dropping Daisy Renton's name, he catches Gerald off guard, and Gerald makes it obvious that he knows the girl to everyone, and most importantly, to Sheila. Look at the stage direction here. Sheila merely nods while she's taking in all the information that's being given to her. At this point, the inspector makes an excuse and slips out of the room, leaving Sheila to interrogate her fiancé for him. This is yet another of the inspector's cunning tricks. He is great at turning the characters against each other. By leaving the room, he forces Gerald to admit his infidelity to Sheila, which in turn makes it much easier for him to tell his full story when the inspector re-enters. Basically, Gerald only comes clean to the inspector because it's clear that his secret has already been discovered, and he has nothing else to lose by continuing the lie. The inspector also goes out of his way to make Gerald feel guilty for his behaviour and his treatment of Eva Smith. Compare the snide nature of this exchange to the generally civil and supportive way he's just handled Sheila, and it becomes clear that the inspector doesn't just ask each person the right questions or push the right buttons to get them speaking he actually addresses each character in a completely different way to get under their skin. For example, during Gerald's questioning, the inspector goes out of his way to give Gerald a lot more information about Daisy Renton than he does the other characters. There is little reason for Ghoul to pass this information over, unless it is to make Gerald feel worse on a personal level. 
so the inspector is measured. But that doesn't mean he isn't above being brutal to get what he wants. Later on, he appears to act even more harshly towards Mrs. Burling, who he clearly doesn't like in the slightest. Here, Sheila is trying to warn her mother of the inspector's tactics. And when the inspector tells Mrs. Burling, yes, and she'd be right, he's basically saying to her, I am going to break you. Mrs. Burling spends her life hiding behind a wall of her own, of course, one of propriety and self-righteousness. And the inspector, knowing this is the same barrier that caused people like the Burlings to behave so badly towards the lower classes, is determined to knock the wind out of her sails. Let's have a look at this exchange. Here, Mrs. Burling is desperately trying to pretend she doesn't recognise the girl in the photo, and the inspector is clearly out of patience with her. He tells her she is deliberately choosing not to understand, and outright accuses her of lying to him, which is obviously going to offend someone like Mrs. Burling, who thinks the rules of society apply to everyone but herself. The same is true of this exchange. Mrs. Burling is going out of her way to avoid answering the inspector's direct questions, and the inspector is continually batting each slippery sentence she utters back at her. Why is he doing this? Well, at this point in the play, the inspector needs Mrs. Burling as incensed, offended, and haughty as possible, so that when he tries to pass some measure of blame for Eva Smith's death onto Mrs. Burling, she will try and wriggle out of it by blaming the girl and the father of her unborn child. He knows she's too arrogant and pompous to accept any responsibility, and that she's incapable of showing empathy for anyone less fortunate than herself, and this is just how he gets her to incriminate Eric. So, poor Eric. By the time he arrives back at the house, his sister has revealed he's a drunk, and his mother has unwittingly blamed him for everything. So how does the inspector get him talking? Well, quite simply, he shows the tiniest bit of support for Eric against his family of betrayers. In short, the inspector says, yes, you can have a drink, when Eric's father says no. At this point, the inspector knows that Eric is going to be racked with grief over the death of his ex-girlfriend and unborn child, so he only has to show Eric the smallest kindness to get him to open up. Indeed, the inspector continues to defend Eric from the rest of the family throughout his confession. However, considering that Ghoul tells Eric he used Eva Smith as if she was an animal, a thing, and not a person, we can assume that he isn't actually as sympathetic towards Eric as he is towards Sheila, and that he offers Eric support solely to get a confession out of him. Of course, all these methods of interrogation raise a good question about the inspector, and points to one of the big mysteries of the play, that is, how much does the inspector already know when he arrives at the house? Sheila is of the opinion that Ghoul already has all the details he needs, while others believe he simply makes a few smart guesses based on some smaller details. This last quote is from Burling, and comes after the inspector has left the house, but it certainly shows how the Burling family realise they have played right into the inspector's hands. It's extremely unlikely you'd be asked to answer an exam question on what the inspector already knows when entering the house, simply because there's no way we can say for sure, but it's certainly an interesting thing to consider. We know he had some background on Eva Smith from her diary, including her previous jobs and some details about the people she interacted with. This has also given him some information that fills in the blanks between each of the Burling's encounters with her. He also knew she was pregnant, having just been to the morgue and seen her body firsthand. But beyond this, it's unclear how much of the information given to him by the family is new to him, or if he is even telling the truth on the few occasions when he claims to have not known something, such as when Sheila admits to having Eva Smith sat from Millwood's. However, it is also entirely possible that the inspector knows far less than he is letting on. As far-fetched as Gerald's theory on Ghoul's visit is, that a man comes here pretending to be a police officer, that it's a hoax of some kind, it could be completely correct. The inspector could be pretending. He might just be working on bits of information he's picked up here and there. He could just be bluffing his way through the evening, offending each of the Burling's high-class sensibilities enough to get them outside each of their comfort zones. If you want to push this theory even further, you could even argue that he's lying about Eva Smith keeping a diary. Ultimately, though, it doesn't really matter how much the inspector knows when he arrives, and your opinion on this subject is bound to change depending on whether you believe the inspector is a normal man or something else entirely. What's important is that, whatever he knows, he gets exactly what he wants from the Burlings, and when he leaves, he knows everything. Whether they have accepted their guilt or not, the Burling family know that between them they've sent two people to their deaths. They're changed for their experience, and it's safe to say the unimpeachable Burling family unit has been broken in a way that can never be fixed by hiding behind their veneer of respectability.
So that's all for now. We'll be covering more on Inspector Ghoul in the video that focuses on meaning, structure and ambiguity later in the season. Our next video will focus on the victim of the story, Eva Smith. But we'd recommend you attempt to write a few sentences in answer to each of these questions before you move on. Question 1. How would you describe the inspector? Choose five words or phrases that you feel sum up Ghoul's character and write a sentence or two explaining why you feel each one is appropriate. Question 2. How does the inspector behave differently towards each of the characters? Explain some of his interrogation techniques. Question 3. Does the inspector behave in a professional way towards the Burlings throughout the evening? Try to back up your opinions with evidence from the text.